Coming up on the Civil Discourse, neuroscientist, philosopher, and literary scholar Ian McGilchrist discusses his books, The Master and His Emissary, and The Matter with Things, which explore the left and right hemispheres of the brain and their impact on the history of civilization. And effectively, what I think I can see is that twice before, and I feel for the third time now, a civilization overreaches itself. It becomes too big, too powerful, too greedy, and its power becomes the big thing, keeping itself going and supporting this unwieldy structure, leading to mediocrity, bureaucracy, and essentially collapse in the end. Hello, I'm Paula Morantz Cohn, host of The Civil Discourse, speaking to you from my office at Drexel University in Philadelphia. The goal of The Civil Discourse is to introduce viewers to diverse opinions on ideas in art, science, and culture. Our guests are accomplished people who can help us think more critically and empathetically about the world we live in. Today my guest is Ian McGilchrist, a neuroscientist, psychiatrist, philosopher, and literary scholar. Professor McGilchrist's writing and research seeks to connect the structure of the brain to how we view the world, and more provocatively, to the way Western culture has evolved over time. He's the author of several books, including, most recently, The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World, and The Matter with Things, Our Brains, Our Delusions, and the Unmaking of the World. Ian McGilchrist, welcome to the Civil Discourse. Thank you very much, Paula. I'm delighted to be here. As a professor of English, I am intrigued by the fact that you began your training at Oxford in English literature. This mm. movement from literature to medicine and eventually to neuroscience, neuropsychiatry, mm. neuroscience, was that related then to a certain kind of disillusionment with this being a literary scholar? Or was it, were you driven by an interest, a specific interest in the brain? A bit of both. There may even be a gene. My father was a doctor and his father was a doctor. <laughs> I tried to escape. But, <laughs> um, but my three main concerns were that it involved the making explicit of what only works when it's implicit. So that all these interesting things that are only just below the level of consciousness, once they're dragged into consciousness, lose much of their power. Much like explaining a joke, taking a poem apart can help destroy it. It doesn't have to, but often does. The second thing about it was that in doing so, we seem to demonstrate general principles and general ideas and abstract general thoughts, whereas in fact the thing was entirely specific and individual, that if this particular poem, for example, had not been written, there would be a hole in the universe, the shape of that poem. <laughs> so we lost the uniqueness, we lost the implicitness, and I think the other thing that happened was that it became more disembodied, more abstract, more decontextualized. And so I thought it was a problem that philosophers used to call the mind-body problem, and I went to all the philosophy seminars and I just basically thought that they were too disembodied in their approach, and I wanted to do this in a more embodied way and find out what happened when something changed in somebody's brain and it, it affected their whole being, or something happened in their mind and it again changed their body and their brain. So this was fascinating, and at that moment, Oliver Sacks had just published Awakenings, and I think he was an inspiration. I thought, gosh, if this guy can write this interestingly, about medicine and philosophy, that's where I want to go. And so that's what I effectively yeah, did. Yeah, I, I could see that you already had the germ for your thesis that you would develop through your study of the brain before you began to study the brain, which is fascinating and very much <laughs> yeah. what a literary scholar often does. They come up with their thesis and yes. sometimes impose it. But I do, I do want to note that it's interesting that Sigmund Freud, in a sense, went in the opposite direction. I mean, he began by studying the brain and found himself thwarted and then moved into a far more 
kind of metaphorical and I suppose abstract study of the psyche or understanding of the psyche, uh, which he didn't link to physical structure. And you essentially went from thinking about text theoretically and moved to looking at the brain and looking at the, the body, so to speak. Look at it this way. Parts of being human are our brains and our minds. We are embodied beings and we're spiritual beings in my view. We are amphibian, we live in these two realms, and so neither is complete without the other. And so a good writer about anything that concerns so nearly the nature of our existence as the brain should also have a wide reading in philosophy and literature, in my view. Well, I do think that you happen to be working on the brain at a moment in time when you could do the kind of study that you have done, I guess, with fMRI imaging and so forth to understand the brain more fully than you could have done, say, 50 years ago. M imaging is a very important part of the research that's done. And I did a, a spell in Johns Hopkins in Baltimore looking at asymmetry in the brain of people with schizophrenia. There's a normal asymmetry of the brain, as you probably know. And this asymmetry is either completely lost or reversed in people with schizophrenia. An interesting question, why? What does this have to do with the whole picture? And the answer is quite a lot, because those very regions that are asymmetrical are at the core of understanding the world, being able to express what one understands of the world, and these are the sort of things that go astray in a condition like schizophrenia. And I incidentally found that there were issues to do with the, the difference between the two hemispheres, which was already a deeply toxic topic at that time. Everyone advised me, don't, don't touch it, it's pop psychology and so on. I, I, I mean, they were just unnecessarily put off by the fact that there was a period in which we tended to get it wrong, as we were bound to, we were just approaching this subject. Yeah seeing the unique rather than just the general, seeing the embodied and contextualized rather than just the abstract, and seeing the implicit rather than just the explicit, happen to be faculties of the right hemisphere, which has no speech. So the left hemisphere is talking away, but not understanding or not expressing very well what the right hemisphere is. So let's, let's backtrack a little bit on this right and left hemisphere issue which, as you say, has in the past been associated with a kind of a pop culture, new agey kind of thinking. Yes. Is much more, is grounded in science and in a deep erudition in your writing. But tell us about the title of, of the book, The Master and His Emissary. What does that title mean with respect to those hemispheres? Who's the master, who's the emissary, and what is the basic thrust of your concern with respect to that? Well, the answer to the question is that in my using of this parable or fable, the master is the right hemisphere and the emissary the left, which is interesting because that's already a reversal of the kind of normal way in which it's been thought about, that the left hemisphere is the one that understands everything and the right hemisphere just sort of fills in around the, the edges. But it turns out that the right hemisphere is far more in touch with reality, more intelligent, more intuitive, more perceptive, more attentive, <laughs> generally speaking, has the, the, the grasp of reality. And I'm not the only person in my field who has said the left hemisphere is on its own, frankly, delusional, which is why the subtitle contains our delusions, a brain are our delusions and the unmaking of the world. Because I believe that we're living in a world now where we've been deluded into following the kind of version of the world put together by the left hemisphere, which is a very crude and simple model, a brutally mechanistic and materialistic vision, which is not entailed on us at all, either by science or philosophy. The idea came to me from a little story about a spiritual master who looked after a, a small community that thrived under his tutelage and expanded to the point where the master could no longer look after all the business of the community. So he appointed his brightest and best second in command to go about and do some business on his behalf, effectively a sort of high-functioning bureaucrat, really. And this second in command knew quite a lot, but not enough to know how little he knew. 
like a lot of people who are not very bright and not very knowledgeable, he thought he knew everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. Unlike Socrates, <laughs> and, uh, who knew that he knew very little, but that made him the brightest man little. in Athens. <laughs> exactly right. And there's something in psychology called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which says that basically yeah. the more you know, the less you think you know, and vice versa. But I didn't know at that stage what I've learned since, which is that versions of this story exist in most cultures around the world. What it involves is one power that has great wisdom and yeah. oversight and is moderate and benign. And there is another power that is violent and peremptory and tries to use up the one that actually knows more. And I think what this exemplifies for me is that in all cultures, people have introspected on the nature of their mental world and have identified without the need of a brain scanner that there's two elements here that are producing different pictures. And one of them wants, as it were, to push itself forward at the expense of the other. And that's the world we now find ourselves in, in my opinion. Well, I think that most of us who exist in institutions of any sort are aware <laughs> of what you're describing. And what you also say, which I find so powerful, is the idea that the left brain is seeks power and it co-ops. It tends to, the more it gets, the more it wants. And so it creeps and, and usurps. And that becomes very difficult to resist. And I, and I suppose in the self, but also in the, in the culture, in the society. And yes. that's, you know, sort of what you're describing as the history of civilization in the West as we know it. Yes, in the second part of The Master and His Emissary, I look at the broad changes in the history of ideas from the Greeks to our own time. And effectively, what I think I can see is that twice before, and I feel for the third time now, a civilization overreaches itself. It becomes too big, too powerful, too greedy. Mm -hmm. And its power becomes the big thing, keeping itself going and supporting this unwieldy structure, leading to mediocrity, bureaucracy, and essentially collapse in the end. Yeah. Whereas the, the right hemisphere is the seat of things like empathy. It can understand or it can understand a whole range of values, goodness, beauty, and truth, better than that of the, the left hemisphere. So I, I fear that what's happening is that we're in the grip of this desire for more power, more stuff, the generation ever of more um, value. Well, I want to go through that a bit. You speak of the Greeks as being a moment in history when left and right brain were in a sort of harmony, which mm. resulted in the kind of flourishing of classical culture, Absolutely. but you also see the Greeks as beginning, I believe, the delineation that would be come out of sync in the Middle Ages to resurface with some harmony in the Renaissance. Then in the 18th century, the Enlightenment, again, an over, it's funny that that's usually has been traditionally raised for us as an ideal period of reason, but of course it's a left brain kind of predominance. And I'm reminded of T.S. Eliot's dissociated sensibility that he saw occurring mm. after the mm. 17th century with the poetry of John Donne's metaphysical verse as a last stand in an integrated mm. sensibility. And I wonder if you see yourself as giving Eliot's theory, or have you thought about your theories in, in relation to Eliot's idea of disassociated sensibility. I think he and, and other thinkers in the last hundred years, including people like William James, Bergson, and so on, but among poets, perhaps particularly Eliot, have noticed this divarication in the way in which we have learned to think, what Whitehead called bifurcation, which really is what happened after Descartes. I would say about the Enlightenment, just a, a small aside, that I think its ideals were noble and are noble, and if I had been alive at the time, I would probably have been very much of the movement. What was not perhaps immediately obvious, although the perceptive might have seen it, is the degree to which it was hubristic. It was overweening. It thought, we know everything. We can control everything. 
And it's through that belief that somehow we've got it, we can control it, that we have ruined nature, our society, and yeah, I mean, it is interesting that the Romantic movement followed upon it, and that was a kind of yes. corrective, and Wordsworth, of course, is one of the major figures. But I wonder if, if we trace the history of Western culture, there is a back and forth between, you could say, right and left brain predominance. And I wonder, you know, you do tend to feel that there is a devolution in culture, and yet... I guess it could be argued that there's a continual corrective going on. Do you really believe that we are moving inexorably to a worse point of mechanism? Well, I guess technology being at our, at our disposal now on a level that it hadn't been before make a difference. But how would you respond to the idea that this, will, this, is, an, this is a Hegelian continual back and forth movement? and synthesis. A civilization usually tends to not last that long, about four or five hundred years, and then there's a huge decline and something else comes along. And the, the Greeks and the Romans had their four or five hundred years each, and they followed the same path. And I quite agree, there are correctives all along, but eventually one reaches a point where instead of having what in science is called negative feedback, i.e. where a correction is required, like a thermostat, the temperature is too high, so I lower the temperature or whatever it may be. But you get po positive feedback, which is very undesirable, which is where the more you have of something, the more you get of it. And I liken it to a pendulum that's swinging, and finally it swings so violently that it overbalances the clock. <laughs> yes. You had already mentioned this, but I'd like you to go further into your discussion of the illnesses that you see associated with the predominance of the left brain. And you talk about schizophrenia, autism, and anorexia nervosa, which interests me as well, and I've written about. Mm. Could you explain how these three, and perhaps you want to add to them, but those seem to be the major ones that you address as very much of the 20th and the 21st century illnesses of the brain that reflect this imbalance? First of all, I think it is, it has certainly been argued that schizophrenia is the one illness that you don't see mentioned going back a couple of thousand years to Egyptian and Greek and Roman sources. You see pretty much all the things that we now recognize bipolar disorder or manic depression, as it used to be called. You know, most of the illnesses, including dementia and delirium, but we don't see schizophrenia. And it, there is an argument that it only started in the 18th century. Autism, there is a disagreement about whether autism is simply more recognised or actually is occurring more. And I think the answer is it's a bit of both. We certainly are much more quick to diagnose it, but I think the evidence is that it is also becoming more common. And anorexia nervosa goes back, you know, one can find predecessors of this in the, in the um, mystics of the 13th and 14th century, for example. And I suppose what interests me is the parallels between the thinking in each case and the typical isolated left hemisphere, where the right hemisphere is no longer acting as an anchor in reality. So they all involve delusion. I wonder if you'll talk a little bit about how religion fits into your thinking. I wonder if you yourself are a religious person, because on some level, yes, the right brain is, as you see it, a much more inchoate and will tend to not be able to explain everything. And is that a way of thinking about how one becomes or is religious? I mean, I, I guess I'm trying to differentiate belief in God from this idea of harmony in the brain, and I'm not quite sure how to do that. There were a lot of people who again said, don't include a chapter on this because you know your philosophy is very powerful and interesting, but people will say, oh, he's a faith head. Well, I'm not. I mean, my family were not religious and never took me to church. But in my teens, I discovered the extraordinary riches of of religious poetry, of, of prayer, of meditation, of the liturgy, 
and of the beauty of so much sacred music from the Renaissance particularly and onwards. So all of this spoke to me enormously, as did the idea of nature as not just a sort of passive, dead, material thing, but something that was instinct with spirit and that responded to me as I responded to it. Mm. I still believe this reverberative two-way relationship is very important for understanding these things. Now, to travesty what I'm saying by abbreviating it so greatly, the right hemisphere is, as I've said, more aware of what it is it doesn't know, the limits of its knowledge. It's much more able to accept things that are not yet resolved, that are ambivalent, that require further determination, and it's much more open to intuitive and imaginative thought. So with those, uh, those advantages, the right hemisphere is better able to give room for religion, whereas the left hemisphere is very much taken with the idea that if it can't understand it clearly, and it can't say it in, in, in English, as it were, it, it, it really is not right. It must be something wrong with it. Yeah, no, that's a very, actually very good encapsul encapsulated ex explanation. I, I can see how much you are influenced by Wordsworth and his, his thinking. I do want to end, we're almost out of time, by the observation that your books are massive compendiums and sort of a kind of key to all mythologies in dealing with <laughs> the left and right brain. And I wonder if you find it ironic that it might be viewed as left brain-like in its structure and in the, in the drive to comprehend so much. I mean, in reading The Master and His Emissary, particularly the first half, just deals with everything that the right brain does and everything the left brain does. I mean, you're really trying so hard to, to comprehend everything as though, well, there's one more thing. And then, of course, you do that with the history of civilization. And again, you, you take this to another level with the matter with things. And I wonder, is there a sense in which you're trying to convince a society that's more left-brained of your argument? Is it your own tendency to be a bit out of sync there in terms of not being able to stop? Yes, yes, it's a fair point. I mean, I think I, I would like to hope that I can balance both of the, the uses of the hemispheres. My goal, my aim, my pursuit, my love, which is, according to readers, very obvious in reading the pages, is towards whatever it is that the right hemisphere discloses to us. But I also have a very rational, scientific, and I think rigorous way of approaching things. And what I set to myself was to express what the right hemisphere understands using the techniques of the left hemisphere. Because if I couldn't do that, I would never cause there to be a bridge across, and I could never help people who are somewhat locked into the left hemisphere way of thinking to see, hey, there's more beyond this, and look at this, and what about that? So what I've tried to do is take the reader <laughs> by the hand and by stages take them through the unfolding of a scientific and rational argument, but also, as you know, it's full of stories and literary references and so on as well, so that they can see for themselves how this can lead to a picture of a whole. Now, if it were left hemisphere, it wouldn't be a whole because it's the right hemisphere that sees the whole. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you say, did I go on a bit much to try and be comprehensive? The right hemisphere needs this overall overarching vision. And we used to have these in, in literature in the 18th and 19th century. We rather lost them. And I want to be in that tradition. I, I always say, you know, the left hemisphere is my second favorite hemisphere. And I, I, I don't <laughs> think I would be better. I don't think I would be you a better, you better do writer. It, could you? Yeah, we can't I couldn't do, do without it. I, I, yeah, you can't. No, I mean, I, I, I don't think I would have written a better book if somebody had given me a left hemispherectomy. So no, we. I'm constantly trying to say there's nothing wrong with the left hemisphere. We need it. The only thing is, it needs to know its place. It needs not to be the leader. But that's but it a needs hard to thing be to the, know. To know the its assistant. place. It is. Yeah. And we are, we are in a society where, you know, it's very hard to battle against that dominance because it's everywhere. Yeah, well, there you are. I also think that, unfortunately, people who are left hemisphere driven would not have the patience 
to read a book like yours, which is another issue entirely. Well, it is, and it's something again to do with attention, which is the central difference between the hemispheres. The left hemisphere pays brief, targeted, piecemeal attention, highly focused on a detail. Yes. The right hemisphere takes sustained, vigilant, overall attention to the whole field. And it's that that we're losing in our society because grabbing our attention has, you know, has a, a monetary value for anybody who is on the media. And so we're constantly assailed. Our attention is fragmented. And this deep understanding that comes only from peacefully, quietly applying yourself to something and allowing it to sort of germinate within you, that is harder for us now. Absolutely. I, I talk to my students about this all the time. They tell me they don't have time to think, which is the most, especially mm. now in college, to have to make that statement is very sad. It is incredibly sad. Hopefully they'll watch this and maybe they will be prompted to read your book. I will say this has okay. been a wonderful discussion. <laughs> I wish we could go on longer. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Paula. And thank you, our audience for joining us at the Civil Discourse.